Welcome to The Growth Show with Matt Lindsay, where we discuss growth strategies both for business and a personal perspective, discussing all kinds of businesses, growth strategies, technology, investment strategy, and much more. We are meeting with entrepreneurs, investors, app developers, and property developers. Our vision is to help 10,000 business owners grow their businesses. Introducing our host, Matt Lindsay. Matt is a former banker and corporate financier. He now spends his time building his own companies organically and through acquisition, as well as raising capital for other businesses. Matt works with a wide variety of entrepreneurs and investors. Hi, and welcome to The Growth Show. Uh, Today's guest is Natalie Allport. So I came across Natalie whilst searching through Instagram on the Wim Hof feed, hashtag Wim Hof. Um, and I've, I found a fellow Wim Hofer and I, I came across your profile and you were doing some extreme activities outside in the cold. And uh, yeah, re- really interesting in terms of what you've been up to. But then I started to delve into your background a little bit more and I thought you'd be a really good guest um, for some of our viewers and listeners in terms of both your background as um, it it was snowboarding, wasn't it? That was, that was your sport. Is that, is that correct? Um, And then then you've latterly, uh, yeah, kind of evolved that. And yeah, I think you now do CrossFit, you do Wim Hof and also also lots of other activities as well. And you've, you've obviously got a, a social media company, a couple of other businesses as well. So yeah, quite an interesting mix of things going on there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, first off. And cool that uh, social media can really bring people together. I think that's one of the, the cool things is, um, yeah, you just throw up this hashtag and someone someone finds you and you make that connection and relation. So uh, that, that's really cool. And like you said, yeah, doing a lot of things. So excited to chat about it and dive in. Yeah, cool. So in terms of, yeah, if, if you could start by giving a bit of narrative in terms of your background and the things that you've been up to, I was just in my in my pre-research i was reading your website and it, it was yeah there's there's loads of stuff so yeah i'm really interested to dive into that <laughs> yeah i mean like like you said i think uh i've always kind of been someone who likes to do a ton of stuff um my parents would joke that i would come with them with a whole new life plan and idea every single week as a kid <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, uh, my dad always worked from home. He was an entrepreneur and I'd open his door and he'd be like, what is it this time? Like, what's your, your billion dollar idea this week? And, um, so that's kind of how my life has always gone and the mindset I've always had. But, um, from a young age, I always wanted to be a professional athlete. That was my thing. Uh, when my parents asked me what my backup plan was, I was like, well, of course I'm going to have a million dollar business and this, they're like, is there another backup plan? I'm like, no, 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 (laughs) I'm going to be an athlete and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And so that's really kind of how how things turned out I didn't really take no for an answer ever in that journey and uh growing up I played every sport being in Canada hockey was my main one eventually I I found the sport of snowboarding fell in love it was a sport that did not come natural to me um we lived in a small townhouse and I tried to teach myself how to snowboard by just going up and down like we had three little stairs and I would rocket myself down try to hit a little jump and I spent all my time out there just training. Uh, When I was 17, I ended up making the junior national team. I spent four years as part of the national team program, Uh, fell short of my Olympic goals in 2014, dealt with some mental health issues, had a ton of injuries, ended up stepping away from that sport in 2015 and dealt with a lot of the effects of just my identity being so tied into that singular goal. Um, I ended up diving into the sport of CrossFit, which I took to quite quickly. I've been able to to travel around the world doing some of those competitions uh, and just, wow. you know, kind of reignite that competition flame, um, as well as growing my business, which I started in my final year of snowboarding, which is a social media agency. And I help athletes and uh, brands use social media better and more effectively. So uh, I've kind of transitioned through that whole series of things. I also do some speaking. Uh, you know, I have a podcast and growing uh, some pages on that. So I'm just, I'm just curious about following whatever is passionate to me in the moment and trying to pursue that to, to the fullest I can. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's quite a, quite a, yeah, a, a short, short and sharp um, version of events there. <laughs> and, and, and I guess, I guess in terms of how you, 
how, how do you kind of, you know, you, you, you say you set yourself these goals. Do, is that something that you still do now? And how, how, do you, how do you kind of go through that process? Is, it, is there, you know, are you a visualizer or is it you writing it down? What, what's the kind of process that you go through, particularly when you were younger? Because, you know, most, most kids, I mean, myself included, I didn't really have any idea what I wanted to do. And I probably still don't in some ways. You know, I, I, I love, you know, I, I, I designed my life in a certain way. So I spend my time doing the things that I like doing. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I still feel, you know, I, I'm not doing, maybe not, not doing everything that I should be. And I guess, yeah, so, so how, how do you kind of break down those goals? And what was, what was, was it just, I'm going to be a professional athlete and that's it? Or was it a case of, I found something I like and maybe I can take that further? Yeah, I, I mean, it's evolved over the years. So I'm glad that you you referenced, let's go back to the beginning of how we kind of started with that. Um, yeah, as a kid, I mean, I was definitely big into journaling. I would spend all summer just sitting and writing business ideas in a book and trying to think of what's my, my million dollar idea. Right, uh, right. And none of them were very feasible. <laughs> um, but I had, I just, I thought that if I can just write down as many ideas as possible, one of them has to, has to be good. So um, yeah. I was really into that. But I think, you know, I was just very hard headed as a kid. I was like, I'm going to be a pro athlete. And the more that, you know, your kids at school, they judge you for having this passion and saying you're going to do that, especially when you're not good in the moment, right? Um, you're just starting out. Uh, you get judged for that. And uh, I just took that as more fuel. Like, I want to prove these people wrong. I want to make it happen. Um, yeah. That That's part of, you know, some of the issues that I had with tying my identity completely into sport. But I think a lot of athletes have that mentality with the chip on their shoulder and that just you know, this is going to happen no matter what. In some parts, you know, my goal when I was three years old was I told my parents I was going to make the Olympics. We were watching, I think, the Atlanta Olympics on TV. Um, of course, I, I fell just short of that one, but uh, I almost had given it up at one point because when I did switch to snowboarding from hockey, uh, my discipline of slope style snowboarding actually wasn't in the Olympics at that point. It was in right. 20, uh, 2011 when I did get onto the junior national team. That was the year that it was announced that it would be in the 2014 Olympics. Um, right. So that did change at one point. I think when I did start snowboarding, I started just kind of falling in love with it and being like, I just want to snowboard. I want to be a professional snowboarder so that this can be my lifestyle. Um, and I've always been someone who thinks about the lifestyle first and then what's like the career that can make that happen. Um, yeah. And so I've always prioritized that that piece of the puzzle. And so that was that was my way of goals, but I was very, very goal oriented. I was always writing down everything I needed to do when I started, when I got onto the snowboard team, I would plan out, okay, in four years from now, these are the tricks and runs I want to land. So this season, I need to land this to be able to build upon that next season. And I would break it down per month and then per day. Unfortunately, that doesn't right. work super well in the sport of snowboarding. It might work well in a periodized training plan, like strength training, but in snowboarding, how can you really predict that you're going to land this trick? It could take you years to, to learn a trick or it can happen first try. It's really, really hard to predict. So that also caused a little bit of frustration by being so rigid with that yeah. goal setting. So now I've kind of shifted into a sense where I have these, these very, very large goals and, you know, mm -hmm. just these visions of what I want for my life. And I would say more visualization and thinking through like, this is what I want my life to look like. I want to have the financial freedom. I want to be able to give back and make an impact and invest in, in, in people and, and all these things. Mm -hmm. And so then I break down, I still do the breakdown of like, okay, let's think backwards. What do I need to focus on today? But most of my goals going with, with your theme is, is about growth. Cause now I've kind of built the trust in myself that I know if every single day I'm just investing in my personal growth and getting better, I know those things I will be able to make happen. The years that I've had all the opportunities that have come to me naturally have been the years that I just put my head down, focused on just becoming better, putting myself out there, sharing my story, and somehow things just happen from that. So I've tried to like let go of the end results and just focus purely on the process of becoming better. Um, and then that allows me to pursue my, my passions and take advantage of the opportunities that come my way when they do happen just by investing in myself and, and my personal growth. Okay, and, and, and in terms of that transition that you made into, into the CrossFit side of things, you touched on, yeah, you had a kind of a bit of a bit of a bad time of things. Um, and, and, you know, when you went, I think it was from injury, wasn't it? So you, you weren't, you, you weren't able to kind of maintain the, the, the snowboarding to the, to the absolute highest levels that you need to hit. Um, and that, for, for anybody, that's an incredibly difficult 
bitter, it's a bitter pill to swallow, right? It's a hard thing to take on board that, you know, for whatever reason, you can't achieve something which is, you know, I guess at the time is so close to your grasp. So how, how did you, how did you, you know, how did, what, what, what's the kind of process that you went through there and how did you rebuild and get into, yeah, come across the CrossFit thing and how, how did you make that transition? Yeah, so it was extremely difficult. And I think for many people, for example, um, I think often we think we've invested so much time into something and we, we you know, have, clearly have a skill at it. Or for example, if you're, you're working in, um, let's say fi finance and it's not lighting you up anymore, but you're good at it, you're getting the promotions, it's hard to walk away from that. And that's your identity and it might fulfill different sides of you. For me, I was starting to get to a point where I've been having repeat injuries in snowboarding. Um, despite the fact that, you know, I've broken my ribs, concussions, tailbone, all these different injuries, there was nothing, you know, I seen worse, much worse and people around me much worse and experiencing being in the hospital with them and their parents, you know, what they went through watching their kid getting, you know, like just sitting there in the hospital and all these things that really just started to affect me. When I was a kid, I was like, if I die snowboarding, I die doing what I love. But mm -hmm. eventually got to the point where I, I did develop these other passions. I was doing business school. I was starting my business that I always knew, even if I did become the Olympic gold medalist, I'd still want to pursue that passion there. Um, and I realized that if, if I, another injury happened, that was it like right like you could be your whole life could be affected or your life could be gone and you never make these other things happen and so um i was so singularly focused on the goal it was like do i go for 2018 um just to like make this point and prove it to other people or do i take the step back to just work on my personal growth and my maturity and deal with you know some of the mental health and injury things that are, that are going on so um you know there's a lot of things that happen i actually started crossfit a year before i stepped away from the sport so i was lucky right. to have that community um right. to fall back on and so i ended up yeah making that tough decision emailing the coaches said you know i'm gonna step away after this uh the end of the season uh, I said I would take a break just to kind of keep that, that door open, um, sure. but of course it's been almost six years now. And, uh, and so I stepped in, into the sport of CrossFit and for me, like the mental health issues that I had to deal with, that, with uh, CrossFit helped because I was able to deal with the emotional aspects of not being the national team snowboarder, but I yeah. think I wasn't ready to deal with the aspects of not being a full-time athlete. You know, like a lot of my snowboard uh, friends who are still competing, they they probably thought that I stepped away because I was pursuing CrossFit now. And um, and so they still looked at me with that athlete sense. I still had sponsors that continue to carry over it into the athlete part. And so that kind of gave me a bridge to where I am now, where now I'm like, I can, you know, with the pandemic, there's no competitions. And I feel like my identity isn't tied anymore to, to what I do. It's just, I'm a human being, not a human doing, and I can focus on pursuing my passions. And if I do want to get back into the competitive arena in sport, I can do that without this, like having to prove to someone else something. I can sure. do it just from like a personal satisfaction point. Yeah, okay. And, and obviously, yeah, I've, I've seen some of the CrossFit games, you know, the videos on Netflix and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it, it looks incredibly difficult. So, yeah, do you have a particular particular event that you like most, and one that you like least as well? What what you know, which, which is your which your disciplines that you, are your favourites? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a power sprint athlete. Like anything that's really painful for like one to two minutes, give it to me. Right. Uh, like I don't know if you know those assault bikes, but like they're yeah, like yeah, yeah. people call them like the devil's tricycle. I love that. Like I'm really okay. good at that. I think it's also like the lactic acid buildup that I'm able to handle from snowboarding. Yeah. Um, so anything like lower body power, strength, power, speed, those are my things. Anything long and enduring. Yeah. Not so much. My like ADHD brain is like, I don't want to sit on this bike for an hour. I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm not a great runner. I'm a very heavy runner. So th those are things I'm trying to work on, especially now with the pandemic and gyms closed. I'm like, well, I have no excuses now. Like, I, I got to do some body weight stuff, some uh, endurance stuff, because really it's the most accessible to do without all the gym equipment. So trying to work on that side of things. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, you touched on it there. Obviously here in the UK, we've been in lockdown since Christmas um the the case numbers are going down and yeah ho hopefully we're, we've, we've kind of turned the corner um and and yeah gyms have been shut here for quite a long time so yes yeah, I, I mean I, I i've 
fortunate I've built built myself a gym in the in 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 the house so I've got a room that's dedicated to that so yeah I've got a row machine a bike and a um a cross trainer and, and a bench as well so I've got the kind of basics there um how, how are you how are you managing and I've seen seen some videos of you weightlifting outside in the snow which looks like fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah yeah I actually in front of me so this this room uh, my my boyfriend and I moved uh, actually into a, into a house kind of in the fall us because again like everything's been locked down here in Canada too so we thought if we can't see people might as well be out in nature um so we moved out to a place where it's easy like for example I can cross country ski every day if I want to I just walk down to the trail and I can ski my dog instead of walk my dog which is amazing I love that (laughs) um I love being outside and it's less uh intense on the knees and the joints than running so I've been enjoying doing that I think in the summer I'll be able to great bike trails and everything um, but yeah I have the same thing I have a weight rack I have a rower I have the c2 bike I wish I had the c2 uh, skier I love that machine that's next uh, <laughs> I have some weights weights are really sold out here so I've been trying to get my yeah, hands no, on it's, more it's, it's um, same here you can't get them at all it's impossible it's yeah. crazy yeah it's it's so great and people are trying to sell them for like six dollars a pound I don't know what that would be in euros but like it just like for for triple the price of what they should be basically and so yeah. um, I'm waiting to see where people like the gym should be be opening soon because we're similar like the numbers are going down so maybe people will sell them used so that's my hope because I'm like I'm not going to buy them for like this 6x price it just seems ridiculous um <laughs> but yeah so we have some of the basics here and I'm trying to do some some stuff like that and get outside as much as possible but yeah I've been enjoying doing some of this stuff outside I wouldn't say I, I don't usually in the middle of winter do a full workout outside um, but I like to do the cold exposure work like we touched on earlier. And um, it kind of became my thing with uh, with my TikTok videos. I was sure. like, how can I uh, stand out? Because I like to post these like kind of motivational mindset content. Um, and I'm like, you know, that'd be pretty badass to just be lifting weights out in the snow. I don't think I've seen anyone else do that here. So uh, that kind of became my my thing in a sense. And now I kind of have to keep it up. I have to, you know, all my videos, I'm usually outside uh, <laughs> with like my workout clothes because it just became my thing and it stuck. Yeah, cool. Well, no, it's, it's definitely definitely unique. I think you're the only person I've I've seen on particularly on that on the Wim Hof, Hof hashtag. That yeah, <laughs> um, and and in and in terms of that that side of things, so that that's you know how I came across you as as I mentioned. So when when did you start practicing the Wim Hof technique, and do you, do you use any other kind of meditation or or yoga, or you know what from from the kind of health and wellness side of things? What what yeah what what what's your kind of routine and what's the discipline that you have that on that side of things? Yeah, so so as a like a snowboard athlete, like ice baths were like a huge part of our recovery. Right. Um, we were lucky at the national team training center. We had hydrotherapy tubs, so we had like the cold and the hot, and we would do uh, like three minutes, three minutes, and kind of alternate uh, basically every day. Right. Um, so I always kind of like that aspect, like just especially as a seventeen-year-old kid, you get to go. You're you're part of the national team program. You feel like such a professional athlete doing the ice baths and and everything. So I, I always just took to them, and I, I love doing it. Um, and so it's been like, a, I guess, basically a decade that I've been kind of doing those ice baths right. um, and I would do them at home, hotel rooms, like it's just a huge part of my recovery. Um, yeah. Then when I discovered Wim Hof, I guess probably a, a few years ago, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, I love doing that, that cold exposure stuff. Um, mm. I had never really worked on breath work. Right. So I wouldn't say I do the Wim Hof, I do the Wim Hof breath work most days. Sometimes I do like to alternate and do some other types of breath work. And then similarly, I usually do at least half an hour of meditation every morning. So I usually, I wake up uh, before the sun. It's pretty easy to do uh, when it's winter time and uh, I'll do my (laughs) meditation. Yeah, (laughs) it it comes up pretty late. I'm going to have to wake up pretty early in the summer to keep it up, but uh, (laughs) I love seeing the sunrise, but yeah, I'll I'll do my meditation. Um, I'll try to go outside and that's a little bit of cold exposure work because I'm usually just wearing, you know, indoor clothes Mm. um, and I'll go and watch the sunrise, which I've just heard from neuroscientists can really help with your circadian rhythm and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I'll try to stay outside for maybe five minutes and do that. Then I'll usually come in, do the breath work, do a cold shower. Mm. Um, We do have a river near here, but no one's built a hole and I don't have the equipment to build a hole. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can get that done because I would love to, to do the ice baths. Um, But yeah, I do just the cold shower. And then um, basically from there, either I'll read a book, depending how much time I have, or just, you know, get breakfast and start with my day, depending how long my meditation, everything took. But I like to take like, probably the two hours just to myself in the morning with the morning routine before I get into social media work, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. 
Okay, and the, what what benefits have you seen from the, the in particular the breath work? And if the second question, if you're not doing the Wim Hof stuff, what what alternative methods do you practice? Yeah, so I, I've been reading a ton of books. Uh, the a recent podcast that I finished, or not podcast, but audio book that I finished was uh, a Breath or Breathe by James Nestor. Yeah, and he yeah, talks it's about really good, isn't it? Yeah. It's so good, right? And everyone recommended it to me, and I told them I'm already good at nasal breathing. No, I was lying. I was just that was like ego taking over and thinking, oh, I'm I'm I think I'm good at nasal breathing already. Um, but no, it's I'm not. So actually, I've been basically for two months taping my mouth shut when I go to sleep. Oh, you're doing um, my it. My boyfriend hates that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I was doing buteku breathing for a period of time, and I had I had the, a guy in in Thailand who was showing me how to do it, and he he said, yeah, you got to tape tape your mouth up, and I just yeah, I haven't done it. I haven't. I, I'm scared. I think. <laughs> Yeah. So you know what? The first day I thought I was worried. I think I started it just before the holidays. And okay. uh, I was like, oh my God, what if I like die in my sleep <laughs> with this mouth? But I realized like you just adapt to it naturally. And I woke up without even feeling the need to rip it off. Like it was weird wow. how that happened. I do think like I've been before that I had been trying to like force myself to breathe through my nose. Sometimes my CrossFit coach would give me like, uh, you know, I do a hard workout and he'd say, after this workout, get on the bike and try to do nasal breathing for recovery for 10 minutes. So I mm. had like, you know, brought in that practice of like being at a high heart rate and then switching to nasal breathing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, my boyfriend hates it. He's like, if I roll over in the night and you just look like, especially if I have a sleep mask or something on, he's like, what the heck? It's scary. It's like you're a mummy or something. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm like, it helps, I swear. So yeah, I, I do that. I also bought those like nasal uh, dilators. I bought that recently right, just to okay. try to like open up my nasal. Because right. I don't know, like, it's probably pretty cold where you are, but like breathing out of your nose when it's really cold out, mm. it's like almost like your nose gets stuck. Yeah. So I've been trying to do that. And so if I go cross country skiing, when it is really cold, that for, like helps open my nose and then allows me to breathe through my nose. And people think I have a nose ring or something, but um, it's just this <laughs> nerdy nasal dilator. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's always fun. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to just reading about the CO2 tolerance and how it could actually just help sport. I'm also like, despite the fact that I'm into CrossFit and, and an athlete, I've, I've had asthma all my life. Um, right. and so that's something I'm like, I really want to, you know, get that better because mm. this fall, there was a lot of changes in, um, air, air quality and air pressure, um, right. that was happening and it was just setting me off. And, you know, it, I would go onto a podcast or something and feel my voice get really like squeaky from the asthma. Right. And so I started having to take my puffer again, which I hadn't for years. And I was like, this is so strange. Like, especially as an athlete, I was like, I don't want to be held back by, by my breathing. So I've been trying to work on that. So I, I've just been experimenting because uh, I do know the Wim Hof does help with that CO2 tolerance, but doing, yeah, like the potato breathing and different ones. I've been trying to vary it up. I, I like to change up different things. Like I'll meditate every day, but it might be different. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I've, um, recently come across this stuff called soma which is similar to wim hof um the kind of the kind of breathing technique um except it's got some kind of techno music in the background and so you breathe <laughs> in the rhythm to the music so yeah it's, it's quite it's quite an interesting one but it it makes you i, I think that the the feeling that i get when you know when you really get into the zone with the wim hof and you get all, all these kind of tingles and kind of visual experience the soma stuff does that quite quickly as well so it's quite yeah it's quite a it's quite a good feeling so yeah i'd recommend it I'll have to try it out. I know whenever you search like uh, breath work on YouTube, yeah. often you get like how to uh, like breath work that mimics drugs. <laughs> They're like, and it, you get some crazy ones. And sometimes I do, I try them. And it's funny because again, my boyfriend will walk down and be like, what is happening in the living room right now? And I'm just doing like really quick nasal breathing or something. <laughs> and I'm like, just don't, don't, just don't even look at me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been enjoying just trying all these different things. It is cool how we can kind of change our state, you know, just through breathing. Um, and I'm, I'm just always really curious about some of those things so yeah i've been experimenting around i have to try this on my breathing yeah no, it's interesting stuff and, and and have you found an impact on your athletic performance since you've been applying applying that side of things does that help things or you're not sure yeah i mean it's hard to tell because right now like my 
training is so sporadic being that like with with the lockdowns i'm not doing quite the same amount of volume or the same like intensity i would say um sure. right now i'm like okay how can i just make sure my energy is really high for the work i have to do and speaking and all these things mm. um versus before i was like six hours in the gym and um everything was about optimizing my energy for training now i'm kind of like how does my training give me energy for my daily life so hard, hard to say on that perspective but i do feel like there's times like like i can go cross-country skiing for you know an hour and I'm like I breathe out of my nose almost the whole time or wow. the other day I did a really intense uh, workout it was like four minutes on of this circuit like a CrossFit style workout two minutes off and three rounds of that and in the two minutes off the last two minutes off I actually went to my room and got the tape and just to try because I knew my heart rate was really high in this workout and I wanted to see in this third round could I just breathe out of my nose and you know what it got really hard because my heart rate was pretty high and and spiked in there but I was able to maintain it and then you really feel especially right when you end that workout you feel like oh my god I need to rip it off and get that breath mm -hmm. but if you can fight through it you can kind of adapt so I've been just testing with some of those things so I do think I'm getting a little bit better at the nasal breathing and at least more conscious because I find mm -hmm. I can walk and have forgotten and realize I was breathing through my mouth, but now I'll check in with myself every few minutes and be like, oh yeah, breathe in through my nose. Like, let's get back to that. So I, I think eventually it'll get even more natural. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's something you have to have to continue to practice, isn't it? it yeah, yeah, the idea there. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, it, it, I like the principle of it, but actually doing it, I've, I've been doing quite a lot of cycling over the last year or so. And yeah, when I'm going up a really steep hill, my intention, you know, you kind of end up panting and it's just remembering to, you know, breathe through the nose. And yeah, for the listeners who haven't, um, haven't checked out that book, um, yeah, Breathe, Breathe or Breath by James Nestor. It's, it's really, really interesting in terms of some of the techniques that he talks about. And particularly for people who, you know, have asthma, emphysema and other, other conditions, it can be, it can be really helpful some of the techniques that are, are practiced and i think buteku breathing is one of the techniques that he 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 uses where basically you create an, an element of air hunger but not too much so it's not like you're ready to burst and you you just consistently do that multiple times a day and you gradually build up a tolerance to having uh, carbon dioxide in your blood which is yeah it's, it's a bit scary at first but you gradually you, you kind of learn to learn to accept it and to get comfortable with it and that kind of fight or flight mechanism kind of calms down doesn't it you, you kind of learn to adapt slightly but yeah. Yeah. I like that stuff of like controlled stress so that you can, you know, build your reaction. I think that's a similar thing with the cold showers, mm. cold exposure and same with some of these like breath holds. It's like when you get to, to that stress that you've created, how can you respond to it? Cause then that helps you respond to stress in everyday life much, much better that you can't control, right? Like a work email, a client calls, uh, social media notifications, these things that elicit maybe a stress response, you can better control and create the space there by just doing these practices of like stress training. So like as much as I love meditation and like just sitting in calm, I also like these points where you put yourself in stress and have to force yourself to, to come down because that can only help with your life. And yeah, I love that book. I'm now trying to dive into the oxygen advantage. I haven't started it yet, but I bought it. And I've been trying to get my dad to read a uh, breath or breathe. I keep forgetting which one it is um, because asthma is like very much in my family. My grandma, my dad, like they live on like three puffers a day. Like it's really bad. Um, and they're healthy. Like my grandma walks every day, swims. My dad, very, very, you know, healthy and active works out, walks um, for an hour a day, all these things, but he still, you know, suffers these, uh, the asthma and he has all his life. And it concerns me, especially with, you know, COVID and all these things and hearing people with asthma and lung problems that could really affect them. Um, especially my grandma, he could get pneumonia pretty easily being that she gets asthma. Uh, she really deals with asthma. And for me, you know, I get bronchitis all the time whenever I get sick because of my asthma, just easier for me to get that fluid in my lungs. So I'm like, I just want to be as resilient as I can. And it, it bothers me. Like I'm someone who also has a ton of allergies and I just, I'm like, how, why was I born with, with these things? Uh, how can I help improve them so that I can just live better and be less susceptible to ailments when they do come around? Yeah, yeah, no, in, in, interesting stuff. Well, well I, I think one of the key things that I've been, you know, done lots of research on, and there's there's lots of kind of documentary evidence of this helping is obviously maintaining good levels of vitamin D, particularly in um, the winter period. So, um, yeah, there's there's some statistics that I saw the other day that it 
basically, I think you can reduce your chance of dying if you catch COVID by 17 times just by having a, ba you know, a good base level of vitamin D, which is, yeah, you know, it's not an expensive thing to, to have and yeah, quite can, can make quite a big difference according, according to this, this one doctor. So, but yeah, there's, it's things like that. Yeah. 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 It's important, to, important to maintain. I, yeah, I totally agree. I think vitamin D is deficiency is a major problem, especially here in Canada. Like we don't get, like, even if I was outside, like right now it is sunny. Mm. So, but like, you're all wrapped up with the snow, right? So it's hard to get that exposure. Mm. Um, yeah, I've always struggled. Like whenever I went to the doctor, she's like, you have low vitamin D. And so I take a pretty high dose now um, every day, but again, it's, yeah, it's one of the cheaper supplements. Mm. I think everyone should be doing it. What's actually blows my mind is here in Canada, when healthcare is kind of free, most of our blood tests, it doesn't cost us anything, but it actually costs you extra to do the vitamin D. And I'm yeah. like, that should be very basic. Um, mm -hmm. And like what we're seeing with the doctors saying the vitamin D can make more susceptible to getting COVID and the worse effects, uh, mm -hmm. having low vitamin D. Um, but it's everything. Like I think vitamin D is almost like a hormone. It regulates like those systems. So it can mm. affect your mood, your energy, like so many things. So yeah, that's something I try not to forget every day. I used to take that for granted. Like I'd buy the vitamin D and then forget. I'd go on a trip and not bring it with me. Now I'm like, no, I, I always take, I take, I think 5,000 IU and yeah. I take that every single day. Yeah, yeah. No, re really, really important. No, interesting yeah. stuff. So, so in terms of your your kind of business side of things, so so you've 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 established this you know career career as a as an athlete and maintain that for quite a period of time. So then then you've also started the kind of the business side of things, and that includes so you you, you have a, a a business that where you you manage social media for clients and you help help them promote that. How how did you start that? And what's what's that journey been like? Yeah, I, I mean, it's really been a journey of just like a full circle journey where so when I, I was an athlete, I really had to figure out how to market myself and there was nothing okay. teaching me social media had just started. Uh, I had no idea. And I was like, well, I, you know, financially everything, you know, my parents were very supportive, but they couldn't afford to send me around the world, uh, snowboarding and chasing the Olympics. They said like, we support you in every way, but you have to make this happen, you know, on your own dime. So I had to get very creative, like, you know, traveling around the world. Um, even if we went to say like a junior world championships, most of our stuff is covered, but we had to still pay our flights and everything. Some competitions, you have to pay for your coaches, your physios, the massage therapist. Like we all split some of those expenses um, depending on the event. And so uh, it's it's very much not a cheap sport. And I did not come from, you know, a super wealthy background. So uh, I had to figure those things out and figure out how to get sponsorships. And especially in the snowboarding world, you might be fighting against the same people for the same sponsors. Um, if I'm, I was sponsored by Billabong the, the, at the time, and she's still the top rider uh, to this day. She was also sponsored by Billabong. I'm not gonna get the same budget as she is when we're going to the same competitions and I'm coming 15th uh, in the world and she's coming first, you know? Mm. Um, so I was like, how can I get these, these unique sponsorships and um, carry me forward? So through that, I was able to really learn how to use social media, how to market myself and grow my, my personal presence. And uh, some of these sponsors and companies really took notice as well well as a lot of athletes were getting referred to me for help. They would always ask me, hey, you know, I'm going to the Olympics. I need some sponsors. Can you help me with connecting? Like I heard you're the person to go to. Um, right. And so that kind of just built into starting my social media agency. Uh, then when I stepped off from snowboarding, you know, knowing I always wanted to have a business that just allowed me to grow it and continue. Mm -hmm. And then now it's really come full circle where, you know, over the years, we've helped a ton of businesses, brands. There's a point where we really just helped any type of business. So we have so much experience. It's been really a kind of a learning pro process for me getting to work with so many different industries um, and brands of all sizes. Uh, and now we've focused completely into the athlete and sports marketing space. So really trying to give the education to empower athletes, um, especially like college and pro athletes and up and coming athletes who might not have the same high representation with their agents um, that really need to figure out how they can grow their brands and how that could help with their career. Because it's more than just financially being able to, you know, uh, you know, continue in their sport or make more money from their sport. It's also just like, that's a way that you can make an impact on the next generation of athletes. And I see that, especially in the female side of things, if mm. the female pro athletes have a bigger audience and they can impact and inspire so many more people and grow the whole game as a whole. So I see it as this really cool ecosystem that I'm trying to, to give back to with the knowledge that I was able to learn and hopefully pass it forward. Interesting. So yeah, I guess it's kind of an organic kind of, approach that you've built 
based upon your own experience that you're now replicating for, for clients effectively. Yeah, exactly. And teaching them just how they can do these things on their own. Like every, every athlete is different. And of course there's some basic social media practices that they need to know, but it's also, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I do comes down to like mindset and self-awareness. And so for the athlete, how can, you know, they have minimal time. How can they they uh, really get to know themselves and portray themselves in that way that they want to and, you know, share the valuable content. I'm all about like impact over hype. And I think right now uh, it used to be a trend where it's like, you know, the athletes might post just the successful thing that they did and then log off. And, um, and now I'm like, no, 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 it's about impact. Like what value can you give? Like as an athlete, you have a story that can really impact other people's life, whether it's motivational, educational, inspiring, uh, entertaining. There's all these ways that, uh, you know, sharing your story can, can make a, a larger ripple effect in the world and that benefits you and benefits other people. So I just try to help athletes on, on that journey of how they can do that. And, and for, the, for these athletes at the current time, I could imagine it's particularly difficult given, you know, the potential isolation, not being able to train so much as, as you yourself have, have experienced. So are you, are you kind of helping them from a motivational perspective as well at the moment? Is that is that more prevalent now? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing a lot more athletes who are interested in growing this side of them on social media because they're not, you know, they're not spending all their time right now on the field or on the court or whatever it is. They have all this time at home and they're seeing the rise of TikTok um, and athletes using that platform to like grow overnight to, to hundreds of thousands, millions of followers. Um, and so they're thinking, okay, how can I show some of the things I'm going through? And also like, how can I show the real side? I think that was a big move in social media in 2020 as people are now opening up about different things things like the real side of them the failures the struggles the mental health all these different sides because it relates more to what everyone's doing rather than this like fake persona going through um and i think athletes have a really unique perspective to show that especially if their sport is canceled um you know a lot of people lost their jobs or dealt with stuff that can relate to that same mm. feeling where this you know, this goal or this identity that you have is taken away for a period of time. So can you show people what you're still working on, how you're still staying disciplined or share with them that not every day you're feeling motivated and, mm. and go through things. So I think it's, it's provided some unique opportunities and the fact that a lot of athletes are like, oh my gosh, like I need to get on social media because when my sport's canceled, this will allow me to still make money and, mm. uh, uh, and still, you know, you know, kind of build out my influence and my impact, as well as it's given an opportunity that I think now more than ever, we can relate to some of the stories of these athletes, anyone, um, whether they're an athlete or not. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that's part of the, the reasoning for launching, launching the show this year was, you know, we were in lockdown, it's winter in the UK, it's, you know, a bit of a dark and depressing time. And, you know, lots of people yeah. have been furloughed from their work and so on and so forth. So part of part of the kind of thought process was to, you know, try, try and provide some, you know, inspiration for people that are, you know, considering their options, maybe they want to start, start a side hustle or whatever it might be, or maybe, you know, they, they, they want to leave the confines of it, of, of their existing job and, you know, build their own business. And I think, yeah, part, part of these kind of conversations for me is very much about demonstrating that, you know, whatever you are doing it is possible to pivot. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes, you know, and it, you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to be successful, you know, immediately in everything that you do. And it's much like the analogy of, you know, landing that jump on the snowboarding, you know, you've got to, you've got to put it, put in the proverbial 10,000 hours for whatever it is. So it's not, not always going to be an instant success, but, you know, it's a, for me, it's very much a journey and it's about, you know, having that kind of structure in terms of your goals and your focus and your progression. And yeah, clearly, clearly you, you, you're very disciplined and probably more disciplined than I am in terms of how, how you manage that. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting, interesting thoughts. I mean, I, I try to, you know, every day discipline just gets built and some days, you know, you take those days off and then it gets harder to rebuild again. But um, for me, especially moving at the start of the year was a great way to just immediately get back into routine, you know, and mm. start a new one. Um, sometimes you need those kind of resets. And I think like conversations like these are so impactful and important right now more than ever, you know, to give people the real stories of things that go on and um, the motivation or inspiration or just the relation or spark to, to do something or start something. And I think, you know, now is, now is the time and these big changes in the world and shifts. That's where there's always opportunity and especially opportunity for growth, right? Like we grow through discomfort. And that's something yeah. that, you know, kind of goes back to like with the cold exposure work and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. 
Um, and so I think about that in the year of 2020, I think there's, there's people who took it uh, as a way to complain and further dive into um, the identities that they had before, or there's people who took it as like, okay, this is outside of my control. How do I grow through this? What can I learn from this? And that, that everyone listening and, and is taking that second option. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting thoughts. And, and in terms of your plans going forward, so, yeah, you know, what, what's, what, what's world domination look like for you over the next five years then? Are you, you know, you're going to gonna get the white fluffy cats a stroke and all that good stuff or what's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> I have a cat allergy, actually. One oh, of my right. other That's ailments of allergies, but <laughs> I have a... <laughs> <laughs> not going to work, but I got a hypoallergenic dog and I hope to, to, you know, give her the the best life, you know, part of moving here was so she can run around and get outside every day and do some good things despite, despite the lockdown. Um, for me, just, you know, I, I'm just, I'm so focused on the process right now. I'm just like, I just want to, you know, keep growing, um, learning, creating, and then sharing that, you know, that process, I think it's like a circle, right? Like you do the personal growth, you learn things, you create things and put it into the world so that you're sharing that learning with others. And then you're doing that whole process continuously. And, um, for me, like kind of at the start of last year, I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to invest in putting out my story more. Um, I'm going to invest in my personal growth and see where that takes me. And it led to so many opportunities that I had never even thought of before. So as much as I like to like have everything planned out, it's like when I just focus on those things, these opportunities that I never would have even thought of will, will come and I'll be able to take advantage of them. Uh, I'm, I'm working on actually, I got invited another crazy opportunity that I had no idea would come uh, to do a, a TED talk in April. So oh, wow. I'm okay. trying to work on that. Yes, yeah, so like the, these are things that, you know, I think just focusing on the process sometimes you know and, and your own growth these things can sometimes happen and uh, I'm really lucky to be able to work on that so that's something I'm trying to do uh, I'd love to do more speaking in that space after that um, hope, hopefully it all goes well you know uh, I've never had to write a TED talk or learn how to write a, a talk like that so concisely so I'm definitely working on that aspect and just trying to keep growing what I'm doing and the impact that I can create if I can help more people along the way of building up what I want to build, uh, then uh, I think all the better. Cool. And, and, and in terms of how you manage social media, because obviously that can be, you know, as, as much as it's your business, that can also be a distraction in, for, for many people. And, you know, when you look at, I think everyone's guilty of this, you look at your usage on your phone of, you know, different things and you see, you know, Instagram coming up as, you know, quite high on that list is a bit concerning. How, how, do, you, how do you manage that side of things? Are you quite disciplined in that, in that approach as well? Or what, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Like anyone else, I'm human and I get stuck into the scrolling and, and seeing other things. But I try to like really, one, not not compare myself because uh, I know that's like a big game that can happen on social media. So I'll literally just mute or unfollow pages where somehow that's triggering that thought. Um, and I think it's as easy as that, right? Like it's like, oh, this is triggering me for some reason to compare, feel bad about myself. And I'm like, well, I can just unfollow it, you know? Like I can do the work for sure. And I do do the work to make sure, okay, focus on you. You don't need to compare, but at the same time, you don't need those triggers in your life. So you can just kind of hit that, hit that unfollow and be intentional about what you do consume and try to be intentional about when you consume it as well. Like what mind space are you in when you are going onto those channels? Are you already feeling bad? And then you're going to go and, and scroll, right? Or if you are feeling bad and you have a specific account that always motivates you, just go to that account. Mm. Um, so I think there's things that you can do around that. But, you know, I have so many social media accounts. I man podcast uh, account, my own personal page, and then like my business account and then helping clients with stuff. So uh, I just try to be, you know, understand that there's trade-offs. Like, you know, if I posted more on my business account, that would be great, but I haven't posted anything up there in a week because I'm like, you know what? I only have this mind space. And right now it pays off more for me just to be focusing on my personal channel. My personal channel is also like, you know, I share and document my, my life as an athlete and entrepreneur. And that uh, kind of just gives the, it shows people, you know, oh, this is how she's using and growing her social media. I want to do the same thing rather than, you know, using my business account and only just posting, telling how to do something. I kind of try to demonstrate it uh, in my own sense. So, uh, so I'm just, I'm mindful with what I consume. If I need ideas for, for content, I'll be specific and be like, okay, I'm going to spend half an hour on this day and look through, you know, what kind of things I could create if I'm not feeling so creative. 
otherwise, you know, sometimes like TikTok is actually uh, my largest platform of audience and I spend hardly any time on the For You page looking through videos. It's all about like creating, unless there's like a time where I'm like, I need a spark of idea, then I'll go through, but I spend much more time just like, okay, today I'm going to post my, my daily video. I'm going to edit it, post it, and then like log off and I'll, I'll go back to answer people's comments, but that's, that's about it. Mm. Okay, so you, you, you've got a kind of a structure. And, and in terms of um, kind of, to, as, as the evening comes on, obviously phones can be quite disruptive, you know, when you're preparing for bed and things like that. Do you, do you distance yourself from, from social media in advance of sleep or how, how do you manage it? Yeah, I, I go to bed quite early. People always joke because I don't know if you know the, the app Clubhouse that's out now. And I feel like yeah. for me, it's there's a lot of people on the West Coast uh, on it. And so they always are starting rooms like 5 p.m. Western, which is 8 p.m. my time. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm in bed. Like I'm going to bed around eight. And so, you know, people will ping me and I'm like, just go away. So I usually set, uh, I think I, I only have my phone from eight till eight that it actually sends me notifications. It's usually on silent mode. I do yeah. use it like in the morning for some of my meditations. I use it for that, but I just, I've gotten to the point I can see those email notifications and just like not let it affect me, know that I don't need to check it until later. Um, and similarly in the night, if I get messages, unless it's like from my family, um, I just know that I'm like, no one needs a response from me after 8 p.m. usually. Uh, and so I just try to distance myself because I do use it at night for, I have a stretching routine that plays through through video uh, in, in an app. So I have to use it right before I go to bed, but I just try to like not check the other things and turn those notifications off. Um, and that's actually another thing I should add is on TikTok, for example, I have never had my notifications on. So, uh, you know, if there's a video and it gets like 2000 likes, imagine your phone, like it would just be crazy. So I just have never had them on so that it's not triggering me every two seconds to log back in. Yeah, because that can be quite addictive and yeah, it can bring out some kind of negative cycles, kind of. I, I actually, I, yeah, I don't have Facebook and I, I don't have TikTok, but I am. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got the Instagram app and, and Clubhouse as well, and I, I just deactivate them. I, don't, I can't see anything. So it's only when I choose to go onto those platforms that I know know what's happened on them. So, yeah, I think that's it, it's a bit more of a... It helps a lot to do that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, and, and in terms of when, when you are, you know, the, these are tricky times, they're unusual times, there's a lot of uncertainty. What, what, how, how do you, what, what's your best tip for somebody who's, who's struggling to focus and finding things difficult? Yeah, I, I think just think through like, what is it that's making things difficult? Why is it, you know, I, I think self-awareness is the answer to a lot of things. Mm. Um, because without the self-awareness, you can't move forward or create some sort of plan, right? Like you can hear, oh, oh, Wim Hof will help, or oh, the Buteco breathing might help you, or meditation might help you. But if you're not knowing what is actually bothering you, then it's hard for you to make logical decisions about that or know if something is actually truly working and just dive to the root of that. So I think if, you know, in times of struggle, I always just resort to spending some time alone and thinking through what is really stressing me out right now? What is really important to me right now? What do I need to, you know, focus on? You know, what what ways can I personally improve to better deal with this the next time or to move forward from this? And so just thinking some of those things through, I think can really help because, um, you know, there's everyone has like solutions and things that they can do, but it's figuring out what's, what's right for you to do and what moves are right for you. And I think that involves just spending some time in solitude to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very, um, insightful words there and in terms of your um do, do you have a particular book that you you reference in terms of that that helps you to motivate you or keep you focused obviously we talked about brief by james nester is there any others that you rely on or or, or you would recommend Yeah, oh man, I'm a big uh, bookie, I guess you could say. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of the audio books just because it's easier for me. Like while I'm making breakfast, I can spend that time rather than um, sit. But I do have like a daily reminder that I want to sit and read because I think there is value of just having your mind be able to look at the page and not be distracted mm. um, versus, you know, multitasking while you're listening to an audio uh, audio book. Mm. Um, but there's, there's two books that like one book that I read as a child that really changed uh, some things for me. And I've recently rediscovered it after my move. It was like deep in a, in a box that was in storage and I just reread it and it, it I reread it in a day. It's very, very short. And that's uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. 
I think that's a, a great book and it's kind of about a seagull who uh, he seeks more than what the other seagulls were were doing. They were just focused on, you know, food and hunger and he was figuring out how he could fly faster and how he could do these things. And he was ridiculed by the pack. And there was a whole process of how he evolved and reached this next stage of life and then gave back and taught others. So it's a it's a really cool book. And my dad gave it to me when I was young. Um, and then I basically, it's still his copy really, but I have it. And, okay, um, cool. and then another book that really changed my life. I think I read it maybe uh, five years ago, this is my favorite book, is The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And um, okay. yeah. it, it was, I think it was written originally in Brazilian and then translated, but that's that's one of my favorite books too. Yeah, no, really, really, yeah, I, I love that book. I haven't, I haven't read the, the, the Seagull, but I'll check that out. Um, but yeah, the, the Alchemist is yeah quite, 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 quite an incredible one. Cool, well, from my perspective, it's been really interesting to learn about A, your story, and then B, you know, the, the, some of the things that you've been up to and how, how you motivate and focus. Um, so yeah, I've asked the questions that I wanted to, to ask you, uh, but, and I'm really grateful for your time. So I know you're extremely busy. So thank you for taking the time out to, to, to spend with, with me and my listeners. Um, and yeah, if you've got any closing remarks and anything that you'd like to add, and also of course, where we might find you on TikTok and the other socials, that'd be really great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to, to close things out, I think if anyone, you know, your, your show's named The Grow Show and just think that personal growth is one of the best journeys you can do, right? Like, mm. I, I think that my perspective, like, I don't want to ever look back in my life and say, these were the good old days or this was where I peaked. I want to peak on my deathbed. And so, you know, building off, you know, yeah, I, I was a national team snowboarder, but I think what I'm doing now is just even further in my growth than that and just building off those. So I think just thinking through that mindset is beneficial and knowing that also personal growth is uh, it, sometimes you might think it's a selfish act, but it's very selfless in a sense, because if you're growing personally, you can help so many more people. Um, you're in a better place to, to help others and make more of an impact in the world. And um, so I think, you know, personal growth, self-care, wellness, all that stuff is um, a way of of helping others through helping yourself. So I think that's uh, uh, something that I'd like to lead things off with and really mm. appreciate this conversation. And if anyone wants to follow my social media, I'm on every platform um, as well as my website. And it's just uh, Natalie Alport, N-A-T-A-L-I-E-A-L-L-P-O-R-T. Um, that's my handle on every platform as well as my website is natalieallport.com. So uh, <laughs> it's just my name and it's, it's everywhere. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time and yeah, enjoy your, enjoy your day. Um, and yeah, hope, 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 hope the snow doesn't continue to, for too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a snowboarder, I like it, but uh, with the ski challenge that I have coming up, it, you have to really manage it because if it did snow uh, 15 centimeters uh, while I'm doing that, I think it would take me double the time. And we actually, in our lockdown, we have a curfew. So I have only a certain amount of hours that I even can be allowed to be outside. So uh, yeah, hoping it pauses just so I can do that. Then it can snow all it wants after. Yeah, well, good, good luck with that anyway. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Thanks. Nice, nice to chat. Thanks for listening to The Growth Show with Matt Lindsay. Please like our podcast and subscribe today.